Oh, my, I had no. It, it broke my heart. And I was very hateful if there was a God. I was like, you know, you're just doing this to get at me, so I'm going to do everything I possibly can to, you know, deny you. And I, I just started drinking a ton and womanizing even more. And I had girls over my house. My parents were there. I was drinking and just, my life went downhill so fast. And I quit working out. I just got a big old beer belly from <laughs> drinking so much. And, I just hated life because I was, I was working on top of going to school and the only enjoyment I got out of life my junior year was going to drink with some buddies from work and just get smashed and then go work at 9 o'clock next morning after working until town on Friday. And that was the only real pathetic enjoyment I got for a good chunk of my junior year. And I remember hitting an all, all time low. My junior year, we went drinking with these. Well, we invited this kid from work to come drink with us, and he never, he was pretty much a pretty good kid, never did anything bad in his life, and he just starts, he got really drunk, he starts running all the time. Like, I think he threw up 16 times. I was laughing at him, making fun of him because he was a virgin, and he would, had never killed all his liquor, and he had alcohol poison. Like, oh, you suck, you suck. Everyone's looking at me like, are you seriously, guy? This guy might die. And I didn't really care. And so I went to bed, and. <laughs> I woke up that morning and I had my shirt off and stuff and I just went into the bathroom I was going to do my business and I looked at myself and I realized what I'd become, just this fat, pathetic, living in the past football player. It was, I felt a ton of shame just come over me because of all the things I'd done in my life. I'd never felt that kind of shame and it was just like, oh. but then this voice, this extremely compassionate voice said, to me, if you keep living like this, you're gonna die. And I was just like looking around to see if any of my friends were around, but I was like, I think that was God. <laughs> but so that was kind of interesting to me. I was like, wow, I was really caring. I've never heard anything like that before. So I had a friend that came to this youth group. Her name was Beth Ulrich, and she invited me to come to youth group. Was like, okay, so I went. And I met Pastor Kelly and Trevor right off the bat, and I think it was pretty cool. And then I remember meeting Christopher and Benj and Josh McNamara, and I just looked at them and was like, what in the world? <laughs> like, they were just, you know, radiating, you know, Christianity. I didn't like it. I was like, these guys are weird. I don't want to punch them all in the face really hard. <laughs> but um, it was really interesting because the second I got invited, well, but, oh, I wish I could. The first time I went to youth group, there was, there was nothing really going on, but the week after there was a concert, and so I was invited to that, because there was bands like, like Thousand Foot Crush, I was like, oh, that's cool, because I, I didn't know if Thousand Foot Crush was a Christian band. So I like, sweet. So I decided to go to the youth group, and there was all these other Christian bands, and there was all these people out there giving their testimonies, and there's people just like, during worship songs, just being you know, like this, like, ah, like just crying tears of joy. And there's people, like, I could see Trevor and Mackenzie, and all these people just like praising God, and I was just looking at them like, it was weird because I, I didn't have that in me. I was just, is this real? I, mean, I couldn't believe people were just, it, it blew me away and it kind of creeped me out. So I quit going to use it for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> then, um, I met this girl. And I guess it was the first time in my life I cared for somebody other than myself. And I kind of started changing the way I was living because that voice kind of creeped me out. I was like, I don't want to die. So I quit, I quit drinking, quit smoking, quit chewing. For being an idiot, well, I'm still an idiot, but um, <laughs> I just tried changing my life under my own strength. And um, well, it ended up happening this girl and I broke up, and they crushed me because I changed under my own strength, and it seemed for like no reason. It's like, oh, so I was just really, really depressed. So I just, <coughs> I called Trevor up, I was like, I need to talk to you about something. So I just kind of explained to him what my life struggles have been. He just gave me, he gave me some biblical advice, and I was like, <coughs> one of my husband put his on. But he's like, he invited me to come to youth group that night. He shared his testimony that night. And that, his testimony absolutely for me. Because my whole life I figured Christians were just these little good, good people that, you know, did this every Sunday, you know, out there at work, like whatever Catholics that I grew up with. That. And I just thought it was a stupid religious, religious thing. But Trevor's <laughs> life, just what he went through, it just literally was everything I had gone through. And it absolutely for me, that, for me that this was possible. It, 
It made Christianity really me. To hear what he'd come through, to being redeemed and being a good pastor and caring for somebody, just living for Jesus. That was all I cared about, and that absolutely for me. So, <laughs> I, I didn't give my life to Christ that night, but I seriously considered that this is real. So I started hanging out with Trevor Moore. Trevor's probably the only friend I had my senior year because I pretty much burned every bridge at that point. So we would just go to the gym, work out, and just kind of talk, and, and he was just a faithful witness to me, and started seeing, you know, how true this Jesus fellow was, and just like, it's kind of cool. And it took me about four months of just hanging out with Trevor to actually give my life to Christ, because I went through some really lustful relationships before I did that, and I was just kind of tired of living like this. I just had enough of all this crap I was looking for, and I wanted what Trevor had, because it seemed real and <coughs> tangible, and this is, this is real. So on um, February 2nd of 2012, I gave my life to Christ. And it was it was kind of a cool day. I just remember feeling like all this stuff was just gone. Like just all the crap, all the baggage I had in my life was gone. And it was it was really cool. But I still had some issues. I mean, I didn't really completely believe everything in the Bible. I cannot even I don't even read Genesis so like this crap that no, no, this didn't happen. Because every other there's all sorts of creation stories, so I'm not going to believe that this one's the right one because it's the one. Okay. Then I was telling Christopher about it. He's like, you know, this is actually this is actually truth, right? Everything word for word the Bible is true. Like, even Genesis. He's like, yeah. I was like, <laughs> no, you're crazy. You're a fool. And so he gave me this book. And I'm so glad I did. <laughs> but it was called Refuting Evolution. Because mm -hmm. I was, like I said, I was an atheist for a while and he kind of adopted that evolutionist belief that you come from somehow nothing in but create something which is not possible because matter says you can't create something for nothing. So, I don't know how people can believe that, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> so, I was reading this book, and I was getting mad, really mad at the creationist stance, the Christian stance, like, these guys are nuts. I believe this. He's like, you need to read Genesis. Oh, so I read Genesis. I burned through the whole creation story, through the flood, and I read that whole book. I was up until 3 in the morning, just so angry and trying to figure out. Just, and I just finally broke down and was like crying, God, you need to show me this is real because I can't see any proof in this. And then I was just trying to like come up with ways to prove evolution story or if that the old whatever held or if the, and have any of you heard of glacial Lake Missoula? Mm -hmm. Well, supposedly there was this glacier here and it made this lake. And so that was why there's all these like, you know, terraces on the valley, like the water receding. It was like, there's proof that the world is and I was trying to think about it. It was covered by water, like right in Missoula, and like, I was just so frustrated because, and I realized, wait, in Genesis, there was a flood that covered the whole earth, and the water started receding, and that moment absolutely was, I got, I was, it was awesome. I got so lit on fire, I couldn't believe every single stinking word in there. <laughs> there's a song by, I don't know if any of you know the band Switch, but there's a song called Awakening, and that's how I felt, like, I was just completely, Oh, it was amazing. Woke up kicking and screaming on fire for Jesus, and it was just, I want to tell the world that you need a Savior. I, everyone I met, I would just tell them how awesome he is. He pulled me out of this mess. And it, just, it didn't matter. I told all my friends, I told everyone I knew how amazing this God was. All those people don't talk to me anymore, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, that was all I cared about was just sharing Jesus. And I believe it's Matthew 14 through 16, it says, You are the light of this world. No one puts a, I don't know if we see on a hill that's meant to be seen, you don't put a lamp, you know, that whole, I don't know exactly, but you know, they And that's what I wanted to be, I wanted to be a light. I wanted everyone to know how awesome this guy was. But, um, kind of been going through a cold season recently, I got a job at Allegra, and I had a girlfriend, so I was pretty content, and I was just kind of living more for the mundaneness of my life instead of Jesus, so I kind of settled for, you know, the world again for a little bit, I was like, I'll just, I'll just kind of live, because I'm very happy. Well, it turns out that that relationship came to pass really hard. And then work got really, really stressful, and it's been a lot of five months, but they decided to fire me. Right? But, you know, the Lord says that I know the plans I have for you. They are good. And they'll lead to the future. So I'm so thankful that I know my Savior and that his plans are good. I don't know what my future holds, but I know, my but I know who holds my future. So I'm very excited for whatever he has for me. Thank you for your attention. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> okay.
Okay, let's start your, today is going to be uh, kind of history. I'm going to try to share some things with you that you never knew existed, or some information on the Jewish faith and the, the process that they went through and the things that they believed in. So let me start with what I'm wearing today. I have this, my skull cap, it's called Kippah, and it came into vogue after the, uh, the uh, Hebrews were released from bondage in Babylon and were allowed to go back into the land of Israel. Uh, and they, they really don't know exactly why it started, so some of the interpretations are, one, it identifies you as a godly man, because every Jewish man wears one. Uh, so it's kind, of a, it's kind of a neat symbol, I think. <laughs> So that you can walk around and see the godly people in your community. And, uh, sometimes I wish the Christians would do so similar things. I know some started the WWGD bracelets and that type of thing, but it's you know it's a good way to show the world who you are and who you believe in. It also uh, they believe that since man is sinful and God looks down upon you, the kippah hides your sins from God. Not a real good reason to wear one, because it doesn't work, of course, but that's part of their beliefs. Uh, another uh, reason to, to wear it is when you start acting ungodly and become uh, earthly, it's just a good reminder to you of who you are in, in, in your walk with God. So this is what is called a tleet. Again, when this came into vogue, by the rabbis when they came back from Babylon, because there were 70 years in captivity, why they adopted the Babylonian culture. And they did their arts and all of that stuff, and, and as, as well as that's you know, where they bought their clothing. And their clothing or dress was similar to ours. If you look at our clothes, it's round at the bottom. And in, uh, I'm not sure what passages it is, but God instructed the Israelites to wear tzitzits, which are these, these are tzitzits, and it, they instructed to wear it from the corners of their garments. So if you have a round garment on the bottom, you have no corners. So they, they developed this for the purpose of wearing the tzitzit in, in uh, doing what the commandment that God gave them. It has various symbols that the person can live with. It is very similar to that they are living under the wings of God. Uh, that's the symbol of it. It is, in very practical purposes, they would use it. This is your. This would be your prayer, prayer closet. When they pray every morning and every night, they would they cover their heads and they would do their prayers. I know you've noticed that when they pray, they always keep in motion. That is in, that is in compliance with God's commandments to pray with your whole being and your whole body. So they keep their body in motion to do that with. So one other thing, or a couple other things I'd like to bring out for you is, and these are for if you ever have a chance or opportunity to witness to a Jew, there are some things that you should not do. Number one, Never mention the Crusades. The, 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 those soldiers, as they were called, mercenaries actually, went in the name of Christ and killed and murdered millions of Jews. So it's not a good memory to those people. Uh, and, and they still remember those things. And the Arabs obviously do, because they still hate us today. And that's part of their, their problem with the Americans or Christians. Uh, something else you should remember is don't use anything in the New Testament because they don't recognize that. They don't have that. Okay, so use messages in Psalms, Isaiah, uh, and there are several other books of the Bible that make reference to the Messiah, Jesus, in their lives. Uh, and always remember when they talk about the scriptures. The Bible, the New Testament always talks about the scriptures. 
Well, their scriptures are the Old Testament that they're referring to. So, Jesus, there was enough information about himself in the Old Testament to point to the Jews should have known who he was. Uh, and the other thing I might want to reference to is don't call it the Old Testament. Because the Jews, that isn't an Old Testament to them, that's their book. Uh, today in Israel, this is the year 5,774. So they've had the book a long time. So what it's really known as is the Tanakh. And that's what you refer to when you're witnessing to one. Is the Tanakh. It stands for the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible. It stands for the Kippadim, which is the prophets. And then Nehavim is the writings. Or I may have them backwards, but anyway, that's what they are. It stands for the law, the writings, and the prophets. And that makes up the, the Old Testament, as we call it, or the Tanakh. So with that information, let's look at some of God's words. So turn with me to Leviticus chapter 23. morning is, is we're going to go over uh, the feast of Israel, and I want to look at verse 1. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, These are my appointed feasts, the appointed feasts of the Lord, which you are to proclaim our sacred assemblies. So I know we always hear about the feasts of Israel and, uh, you know, the th different things that they do. But, in fact, these are God's feasts. He gave those to the Israelites for uh, rest, for enjoyment, for times of peace. And so the question is then, if they are God's feasts, should we as Christians who we, we study, we are grafted in, we are adopted, we're, uh, you know, we are Abraham's seed. Should we be celebrating these people? <coughs> uh, I don't have an answer to that. I think that's up to the individual. As, as you know, we celebrate Passover here at the church, and so we do keep that. Uh, some of us uh, here, we celebrate Hanukkah. Now, the Hanukkah is not to be confused with the seven feasts that we're talking about here today. Because Hanukkah is a national uh, holiday, just like our 4th of July would be a national holiday. So, so do we need to, to celebrate these and the church today is just overlooking and forgetting about that? I don't think so. But my goal here is today is to make you aware of, of them and what the Israelites did in response to God's commandment, that these are his feasts. So go to the first feast we are looking at is Passover, in, starting in verse 4. It says, These are the Lord's appointed feasts, the sacred assembly you are to proclaim to their appointed times. The Lord's Passover begins on twilight on the 14th day of the first month. So let's take a look at that. There's some information there. Back in the days that this was written and these people were given these instructions, they didn't have iPods or cell phones or any other form of communication devices. They didn't have clocks and they didn't have calendars. So let's take a look at this on the first month of the year. So how would a person determine the first month of the year without clock, calendar, daylight, table times, any of that type of thing? So the, the instances are, this is the first month of the year according to God's calendar. And that is in the springtime. So the citizenry would know when that month had arrived when the almond tree would start blooming. 
we look at it locally, we see pussy willows start blooming. Uh, the first fruit that I know of that blooms in, in the Valley County is the apricots. Uh, in New York, or Washington, D.C., New York, we have the cherry blossoms blooming. So once they knew, saw that the God's nature was starting to bloom, they knew that that was springtime. So they knew then that was the first month. So then we go back to the 14th day. How are we going to know what the 14th day is? Well, they, the Jewish calendar is what they call a lunar calendar. It's based on the, the moon and the number of days it takes for the moon to go around the earth. And that's 28 days. So the dark of the moon, when it's totally dark, that's the first of the month. So the 14th day, which is full moon, that is the middle of the month, or the 14th day of the month. So all they have to do is look in the skies, when they smell the almond trees blooming, look in the sky, and they can see on the day that it's full moon. So they know that's the 14th, on the 14th day. So then we go back a little further in the <coughs> passage, at twilight. As you know, God created the earth, there was the evening and then it was day. And that's what the Jewish calendar, or Jewish day, is. It begins at sunset on the, of the day, and it goes through night, through day, and back to sunset. <coughs> so that is when their day begins, is the sunset, not in the morning. So the way you tell that, and of course Israel is a very kind of arid country, so they don't have too many days that's cloudy. So they can see the sky all the time, most of the time anyway. So to tell when twilight is, like when Sabbath begins, or when these feasts begin, uh, they would go outside and they could look into the sky. And at the moment in time that you can count three stars in the sky, that's sunset. And that's when the day begins. So it's a pretty simple process. You just have to be aware of, what, of their surroundings. And so they were able to, through God's instructions here, follow those instructions. So what is Passover for? It is in remembrance of God taking his people out of bondage in, in Egypt, uh, releasing them from slavery, and freeing them to be a people group that they can be his people and that they can worship him. So how did Christ fulfill that? He, he redeemed us and released us from slavery of sin. So that is why on his, on his death, as he was crucified on Passover, why we are released from that bondage to sin. So now to, to, to 23 verse 6. It says here, on the fourth... Fifteenth day of the month, the Lord's Feast of Unleavened Bread begins. For seven days you must eat bread made of without yeast. Uh, on the first day, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. Uh, for the seven days, present an offering made to the Lord by fire. And on the seventh day, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work again. So that is what the Feast of Unleavened Bread is. And of course we, we know what leaven is signified in the Bible as sin. So uh, we are to live our lives through those days without sin. And it was, you know, I mean if you had to sit down, if you were, if you were a bread-eating people, which they were, and that was part of their staple of their diets at that time, and you had to eat unleavened bread for seven days, uh, you would think it was a sacrifice, for sure. <laughs> so, uh, so how did Christ fill that in, in our, in, see, he is, he is our unleavened bread. He, he has, with it, a few, I don't have a piece with me, but you hold it up, it has little holes in it. Jesus was pierced for our transgressions, and he was whipped. Uh, the dark lines on the 
Matza is uh, significant of the stripes that he suffered. And again, he, he was without sin. So he fulfilled that Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, go then to verse 9. It says, The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, When you enter the land, I am going to give you, and you reap its harvest. Bring to the priest a sheaf of the first grain you harvest. He is to wave the sheaf before the Lord, so it will be accepted on our behalf. The priest is to wave it on the day after the Sabbath. So what is the day after Sabbath? Sabbath is always on Saturday. So the day after that would be Sunday. And to us, we know that as the first day of the week. And that is why we celebrate Easter, I guess you want to call it, on the Sabbath. But that's when he was, in fact, raised from the dead. So they were due to, to go to synagogue, do their, you know, their worshiping of the Lord on that day, and again, do no work. Uh, it was the celebration of the barley harvest, which is the first harvest in the springtime. Uh, it's hard for us to visualize harvesting barley in uh, March, but that's when they did that. Uh, their season is much like, oh, somebody referenced it the other day, to, similar to L.A. or that, about that kind of uh, warm temperatures. So they do start, they do plant their uh, fields very early in the year. So they were to bring their harvest in, and they were to bring in their first harvest, the first ones that they would harvest out of their field, which is known as the first fruits, that would be brought in to the gift to the priest, and that they would make an offering there in the holy temple for the people. So how does that work? Christ is fulfilled by uh, that feast that he, that he has given it. Well, it says in 1 Corinthians, it says, By Christ is indeed been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So Jesus is our first fruits. He is the first fruits. And he fulfilled that feast at that point in time. So then look at uh, Leviticus 23 down to verse 15. It says, From the day after the Sabbath, the day you brought the sheaves of the wave offering, counting off seven full weeks, count off 50 days up to the day after the seventh Sabbath, and then present an offering to the new grain to the Lord. From whoever, from wherever you live, bring two loaves made of one-tenth of ephod of flour and bake with yeast as a wave offering of first fruits to the Lord. Here we have a second first fruits. This is called, was what is be known as the, the Pentecost, or Feast of Weeks, or in Hebrew it's Shavuot. Uh, it is to celebrate the second harvest, or the harvest of, of wheat. And this is the, the most important for the Israelites. This, of course, would be the most important harvest of the year, because that would mean that they were going to have a food supply for the for the following year. Uh, if something had happened to their to this harvest, they would have to rely on eating barley that they had harvested in the springtime, which doesn't make terribly good bread, but I guess they can make it. So. Uh, they would always hold the barley in reserve until they would, until they would actually harvest the wheat. Then they would, they would then use the barley to feed their animals with, and they could use the wheat to feed themselves with. And this is, it's inter interesting what he says there, that this is the only time of the year that the priest is allowed to bring bread with leaven in it into the temple. 
because it says that he is to bring two loaves of bread with uh, fine flour, and it is to be leavened, or normal bread. Uh, many speculate that <clears throat> two loaves of bread represent, one represents the Jewish people, and the second loaf represents the uh, Gentiles, or us, as presenting that all people shall be under him, or shall come to him through that process. So that is the Feast of Pentecost. How did Jesus fulfill that? Uh, it says this is the second harvest of the year. It's interesting to note here that, that the celebration of Pentecost is also a celebration of the giving of the law. When Moses came off of Mount Sinai and he presented the people with the law, uh, and then, as you know the story, there were 3,000 people who died that day because of their disobedience to God, and they worshipped the, the, the golden calf that Aaron had created there. Uh, so that's what their day, of partial of their worship is, a celebration of that, of receiving the law there. Why did Christ fulfill that? He gave us his Holy Spirit. Uh, through, if you remember, um, they were gathered in a, in a gathering place. Uh, we know that that had to be in the temple area or in the courtyard in front of the temple because unlike Passover and Shavuot or Pentecost and the Feast of Tabernacles, which we'll get to, those three feast days, all Israel, Israelite men are instructed to go to Jerusalem and make sacrifices to God. So there would have been a large crowd of people there at that point in time, and they were there in the Temple Mount as God commanded them. So when the, Paul was speaking and the Holy Spirit came down upon them, and they received that, God fulfilled that, or Jesus fulfilled that by sending what he called the Comforter to them at that point in time. And it's interesting to note that 3,000 people were saved that day. So uh, the, the giving of the law, 3,000 lost, giving of the spirit, 3,000 were saved. So then we come to, those are the conclusions of the four spring feasts. Now we go through the summer and we go into September and God talks to us about the Feast of Trumpets. And that is referred to in uh, chapter, verse 23. And it says, this, The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, On the first day of the seventh month, you are to have a day of rest, a sacred assembly commemorated with trumpet blasts. Do no regular work, but present an offering made to the Lord by fire. It's interesting to note that this is all, in the whole the Bible, this is the only mention in all of the instructions that they had to deal with for the Feast of Trumpets. Uh, very little is given about that. All the other feasts that's talked about in Numbers, <coughs> and Exodus, and, and there are other passages that kind of fill in what, the, what those feasts are about. But this is all we have for the Feast of Trumpets, to be a sacred assembly and you are to do no regular work. <coughs> so what happened on that day? They went to synagogue, they did different activities throughout the day, and they blew the shofar at each one of those points in times. And there was absolutely no work to be done. It was a day of rest. Today they celebrate it as Rosh Hashanah, or the head of the year, or New Year's. Uh, it came about, uh, I don't know, when, when, did it, when did they start celebrating this as the New Year's? It's the civil calendar. It, the yeah, beginning so of the civil. It has something to, after, the, after they came out of captivity anyway, is when this became the uh, New Year. <clears throat> so, this began, or this day, 
is also known as a day of remembrance, or a day of reckoning, or a day of beginnings. And this begins a very serious and solemn time period for the Jewish people. It is known as the first day of awe, and it's ten days between the blowing of the shofar and the day of atonement. And it is believed that on this day, God has two books, the Book of Life and the Book of Death. And he opens, he opens those books. And by Jewish faith, tradition, I'm not sure what they call that. Anyway, God says he has the books, and he does open them, and your name is written in the Book of Life, or, or if it's not in the Book of Life, then obviously it's in the Book of Death. So the Jews believed and practiced that this book of life that you're written in is good for one year. So if you die you not that year, you're in. But you have to be reevaluated each and every year. And that's what the Day of Atonement is all about, is that process of evaluation. So the 10 days of awe for the Jewish people are spent preparing for that day. And you go about repenting for your sins that you can remember. You ask people around you what sins you've done that you can repent for. Uh, and it's a very solemn time. And it is just, you know, can you imagine spending 10 days trying to remember all your sins that you've done? so that you would be written in the book of life, so that you would go to heaven. Uh, it's, very, it's quite a concept. But understand that these people did not have access to God like we do today. They just did not have that. God, they were sinful people, and God did not recognize them. Their sin stood in their way. The only way they had access to God was through the priest. And Aaron, you know, he pointed Aaron and the priest and the Levites, that was their job in life, is to intervene between the people and God. And they had, the Levites had to do certain things, sacrificing of animals, and doing all the rituals that they do, so that they would be worthy enough to, that God would listen to them. So, their sins were never forgiven, they were just covered over. And uh, so that, that's just the life that they had to live. So the Jews, so then how is Jesus to fill that? Uh, he is not. That feast day is still open. And there are those of us who believe, as you read in the Bible, that the trumpet will sound and a great shout and Jesus will come down in the clouds and uh, receive the bride of Christ. Amen. And that's when I believe uh, <coughs> the day of the rapture shall take place. Can't tell you what year or what time of the day, but I think it's going to be on the Feast of, <laughs> of Trumpets. That's my personal thought. So, what did they do during this period of time? They took stock <coughs> of, of the season of what they had done. They set aside the days to do serious prayer. They did serious Torah study, and they did self-examinations. And so, that they would also then, at this point throughout this period of time, they would do a great vow, which means they would try not to do the sins that they'd done. It's kind of like our New Year's thing, is, you know, I'm going to die, or I'm going to do this, or quit smoking, or even all those things. But these were serious vows, because it determined whether they went to heaven or hell. So they took those pretty seriously. So that's the, the time of the Feast of Trumpets and the ten days of law leading up to the Day of Atonement. So let's go in verse 26. It says, The Lord said to Moses, The tenth day of the seventh month is the Day of Atonement. Hold a sacred assembly and deny yourselves and present an offering made to the Lord by fire. Do no work on, the, on that day because it is the day of atonement. 
when atonement is made for you before the Lord your God. Anyone who does not deny himself on that day must be cut off from his people. I will destroy from among his people anyone who does any work on that day. You shall do no work at all. This is a lasting ordinance for the generations of the, wherever you live. This is a Sabbath of rest. Uh, so, yeah, to finish that then, for he is a Sabbath rest for you, and you must deny yourselves from the evening on the ninth day of the morning until the following evening, you are to observe your Sabbath. Kind of interesting here. Glenn mentioned it here several weeks ago. That when God repeats himself in Scripture, you should take special attention to it and listen to it. Well, here it says, deny yourself. It says three times. So that must be really serious stuff. And he also refers to do no work. So this is a day when they did absolutely nothing, no mundane stuff. Uh, and just to kind of give you, let me see. This is the day that, the Day of Atonement is the day that God would make the final decision as to where your name was written in the Book of Life or the Book of Death. So it is uh, your last chance uh, to get written into the Book of Life. How did God or Jesus fulfill this? He was fulfilled by the shedding of the blood of the uh, sacrificial lamb, which uh, covered our sins and took away our sins. And who also was satisfied or fulfilled by the scapegoat, who took away our sins away from us forever and ever. So that is how that uh, was fulfilled. <coughs> Well, let me now kind of just kind of hit give some highlights. Now, this is where it gets the big thing about why I reference what we as believers in Christ are free from doing. Because we are Gentiles, but Gentiles were allowed to convert to Judaism and to practice Judaism with, with, with Jewish people. So they couldn't go into the, into the courtyard of the, of the temple but they could stay, come in and be in the outer court of the Temple Mount area itself. Uh, but this is what, if you were a converted Gentile to Judaism, these are the things that you would be expected to do on this day. So let me start with the responsibility of the priest. His day would begin the day before. He would. You know, on a normal day, he would get up, do his normal proceedings in the temple of the, the sacrifices that he would do. Then he was not allowed to sleep that night because the next day he had to go into the Holy of Holies. And to go into that point or place, you had to be totally and completely free of sin or anything. So they, he could not have any thoughts when he went into the uh, Holy of Holies, he couldn't have any thoughts of any bad thoughts, anything that he might be upset about with somebody. He couldn't have any thoughts of marital relations with his spouse. He had to be totally, completely focused on God. And so to do that, he was up for the day, he was up all night, and then he worked all day before he actually went into it. So, he was so tired, he couldn't think about anything. <laughs> Believe me, after f night fishing on Georgetown Lake all night, I know you can't think of anything. Uh, so that was what he did. They would start at an hour before sunset. He would start his fast. So he would fast for 25 hours through this whole period of time. And fasting meant no food and no water. You do, you have no intake of anything. Uh, he would go in in the morning, then at twilight he would go out, he would make his normal sacrifices for uh, the love offering, for guilt offerings, for sin offerings, for all the different things that he would have to do. And he would go do those processes. He would go into the, uh, uh, the holy place 
and he would light the menorah, he would burn the incense, and he'd do all the things that he had to do there. Then when he got through that done, he would go do a ritual bath, which is, he would take, and he would do that in a thing called a mikvah. And a mikvah is simply, uh, they had public, private mikvahs for the wealthy and public mikvahs for the poor, or the not so wealthy. And then what they are is they, they dig a hole in the ground, they have a set of steps coming down, and you go down in, you immerse yourself, totally immerse yourself for the, to wash away your sins, you come up out and you go the, up the steps on the other side. So you have a set of steps going in and a separate steps going out. And that was what they would call uh, purifying yourself. So he would go do that process. He would then change clothes into white linens, uh, showing righteousness for him. And he would go out, they would they had picked a oxen that he would sacrifice for himself, his family, all of the Levites, and for all of the sins that may have taken place in the temple area. That was what that oxen was sacrificed for, is to cover that. He would then take that blood and he would go in and go into the uh, Holy of Holies where the uh, mercy seat uh, and was sitting. And they always tied a rope around his leg so that when he went in, if he was not truly righteous and died, they could get him back out because nobody could go in and get him because they would die also. So they always had a rope around him and they say that they also had bells on his garments so that if it got quiet too long, they started pulling. So anyway, so he would he would sprinkle the blood of that oxen on the mercy seat. He would come out, sprinkle it, the blood on the curtain in front of the ox, and then he would, from there then, he would go, they had chosen two goats to be uh, sacrificed for this whole day of atonement. And one goat, they would, they would, he would pick the two goats, and they were to be chosen as close to being alike as possible. And they would cast lots. And one of the goats was called the uh, El Adonai, or the goat for the Lord. And he would be sacrificed for the people of Israel. And he would take the blood from that sacrifice, and he would go back into the Holy of Holies, again, sprinkle the blood, on the mercy seat, he'd come out, sprinkle it on the curtain, and then come out. And then he would go, take his, lay his hands on the, on the scapegoat, or what they call Azazel, and they would take cloth and pour the blood of the first goat on the, on the cloth and wrap it around the neck and the horns of the goat. And he was sent out into the wilderness to die by himself. He was symbolic of taking the sins of the people away from the city or from the whatever. Uh, they were loose free from their sins. And so they would chase him out into the world and that he's, that's why he's called the scapegoat. And they say that they would always send someone out to follow that goat and as he got out away from the city, the cloth wrapped around his neck and horns would turn white so that they would know that God had accepted their sacrifice uh, for their sins. Now it's said that after Jesus' death and resurrection, they continued, of course, the, the temple services, but that after that, the cloth always stayed red. So that's kind of interesting. So that's what the poor priest had to go through. Now, us folks, what did we have to do? Well, our day started at sundown on the day before, and yes, we had the 24-hour fast also. So we had 24 hours of not eating and not drinking. But not only that, we had to go to synagogue five times. We had five services on uh, that particular day. So you considered pretty much you spent those 24 hours at the synagogue. They did a service, the first service was in the, in the evening, and their services lasted anywhere between two and three hours. So they would go, they would do their service, then they would go home, 
have some nights rest, and then they would come back in the morning. They had, they had two services in the morning and had two more in the afternoon. And each one of these services had different meanings and different purposes. And uh, so, you know, like I said, if you had two in the morning, so that's probably another four or five hours. Two in the afternoon, another five hours. No food. You were kind of tired and hungry. So, a part of the, all this process and doing all of this stuff, and oh, yes, by the way, you have to go, as you know, on the Sabbath. You can, it's called the notice of Sabbath rest, or a walk, I mean, excuse me, Sabbath walk. And they run the numbers on that, and that's about 3,161 feet. That's all the further you're allowed to walk to get to synagogue. A foot more than that, you were working on the Sabbath, and you've committed a great sin. So if you lived further than that, you would have to have already come to town and stayed, got a rent, a room to stay in. Or if you're walking 3,000 feet, 6,000 feet over and back, you probably wouldn't make that too many times in a day anyway. So, needless to say, the little town of Jerusalem had probably, I guess, about 2,000, 2,500 population at that point in time. So it would swell to the tens of thousands during these feast times. So, busy place. So, okay, so what are you guys going to do? Or what would we be doing? Spend <coughs> time soul searching. We, we, we'd be recalling the bad things we've done for the year. Uh, we'd be asking God to confess them. And through the process, during the, during the synagogue time, you had, you would recite, it's called Ashmanu. It's an alphabetical list of 24 sins that it's possible for mankind to, to uh, commit. And each one would say, we have. And it's interesting, though, all of these prayers we have are we. In Hebrew, that's Anunnaki. Long word for two letter word in English. Uh, but we have, and then it would say, trespass, slander, uh, been rude, all of these different things. It's all we. And again, that is because they did not have a personal relationship with God. They could not individually go to God. As in, we can, I have. They had to use we. So they say these 24 sins. And, you know, in Jews, the way they Jews are, they did them alphabetical order. They made sure that they uh, didn't say too many. And when they got to Tav, the last alphabet, they, they knew they said sin, enough. So they had to say those. And then they also said uh, the al het And that's another form of prayer that would be repeated at synagogue. Uh, you know, the Catholics among you know what this kind of process is all about. Uh, was it, as you go through a Catholic service where they recite different things uh, many times. And this was, this is a list of 54 sins that you could be guilty of and uh, ask for forgiveness for. And so, but this is a little more complicated because through that 24-hour period, you would recite those prayers no less than 10 times. So you said them over and over and over to get uh, the whole process done. So there we have it. I mentioned that Jesus had fulfilled the, this feast that uh, through his uh, dying on the cross, shedding of the blood, and for uh, taking away our sins. So now we come to the last feast, the Feast of Trumpets, or what is called Sukkot. And that is uh, to celebrate uh, the God giving the uh, Israelites shelter and food for 40 years in the desert. So today they build what they call booths. They build little frames on their rooftops or outside of their homes, and they will go out. They don't go out and live in them, per se. And maybe the true Orthodox maybe do that. But they'll at least go out there, and they will sit and have a meal and wait till sunset. And, and, but they do do the booth thing. Uh, so as the Feast of Trumpets or Feast of Tabernacles been fulfilled, 
Uh, some people say yes, because tabernacles is means to dwelling with God. That's what that is, is you're living with Him or dwelling with Him. So some people say yes, it has been fulfilled because we have the Holy Spirit in us and we dwell with Christ in our hearts. Uh, others say no, it has not been fulfilled and it will not be fulfilled until Jesus returns uh, at the end of the tribulation time. So anyway, so that's what us Jews or the Jews uh, are all about. That's what we had to live with. That's what they live with today uh, to one degree or another. Uh, and I am so glad we're, I am free of all that, that we are free of all that.